All right. Um, I think we'll just be starting in about a minute. So I'll just start screen sharing. Uh, today we're going to be talking about magnetism and electromagnetism, which is basically magnets, but tying in some of what we learned about electricity a couple of weeks ago into this idea of magnetism. So, um, so I guess I'll just start. Um, you've probably heard of magnets before. Magnets have a north and south pole, so that means that something like a bar magnet would work, something that has both this north pole, uh, both a north pole and a south pole. And the way that the magnetic field is formed is it's created in this kind of looping shape. And what's interesting to note is that unlike electric fields, as we saw in the previous topics in the previous weeks, electrics, if you remember, they were like stuff like protons that exerted a field that emanated outwards. So this idea where everything comes from this one point and nothing's going inwards, or a negative charge where everything's going inwards. I'll use a different color for negative. Everything is going inwards like this. So these are how electrical charges work. And you can kind of draw a parallel between the two because in both cases, there is still going to be this kind of from one end comes some arrows and from the other end comes arrows come inside. But it's also pretty different as if you have a single magnet, it's always going to have both a positive and negative end. It's kind of like an electric dipole, but it's going to have arrows that go both outwards and uh, inwards. I'm going to erase this and inwards. So you're going to have arrows pointing from south to north when it's inside the magnet, and the arrows will point, the field lines will point from north to south when it's outside the magnet. And if you have a magnet and you break it in two pieces, then each piece is going to be an equally strong magnet. They're both going to be the same size magnet, so they're going to have the same uh, strength, and they're both going to have a north and south. So you can't just have what we call a magnetic monopole. A monopole is like an electric charge where there's just one sign to it. You can't have something like a south that's just south and it only takes in and does not give out magnetic field lines. And you can't have a north pole that gives out but doesn't take in. You have to have both together. So you would get something like this if you wanted to break a magnet in half. And this is very different from electric um, charges where everything, um, including the electric dipoles, if you have something like this, where this is positive and this is negative, looks like uh, basically one side is positive, one side is negative, but it's made up of one positive singular charge and one po and one negative singular charge. So uh, this is in this aspect, it's very different. And these are just some examples of how these magnetic fields words uh, fields work. Very similar to the idea of electric fields, where um, the density, I guess you would call it, of field lines. Like this is more dense than this, let's say, then like even over here where it's empty, um, that indicates the strength of the field. So right here is very strong, right here is relatively weak, um, that kind of idea. And also north goes to south. So poles will emanate or arrows will emanate from the north pole into the south pole. But of course, if we were to extend this magnet, um, just remember, keep in mind that this would also have the south pole here, and this would also have a north pole right here. So if you want to connect the field lines, we would still see something like this, and maybe it would come back like this, something like that. Um, there's also horseshoe magnets, which you've probably seen depicted in cartoons, where there's this idea of, again, north and south pole, and it allows for attraction. And finally, Earth's magnetic fields. So you've probably heard of compasses, and this idea is what lets us use compasses. So, um, oops, not mean to go forwards. Um, Basically, the way compasses work is it's just a small piece of some kind of magnetic material, like iron or something like that. And what you do is you just put it somewhere on you have this needle. So I'll just draw like this compass head. I'm not an artist, but let's, let's call that a compass needle. And you put it on something that can spin. So this is some kind of pivot here. And ideally, it'd be frictionless. And you can also let it spin. So if there's a force here, it'll turn that direction. And the idea is, because it's um, magnetic, it'll be forced to align with the Earth magnetic field. So if you have a compass, it'll point towards direction along the Earth's magnetic field. So the Earth's magnetic field always points from south, from the south pole over here to the north pole in this direction. And that's what allows us to say, if I have a compass, then if you're standing over here 
and you have a needle, let's say the needle is pointing in this direction right now, then if you put it in the field, if you consider the field, then it'll be forced to change its orientation to something like this. And that will be able to tell you, if I look at this side then, that was gonna be north. And something that's kind of interesting to note is that this, we call this north pole here, and the south pole, as you do in daily terminology, that just the geometric north and south poles. However, the magnetic poles are actually different because if you remember, our north poles are what emanate on magnetic field lines. So like here, um, north poles are emanating like here, whereas the opposite south poles are what take in the field lines. And here you can see that in this diagram, this diagram is not wrong, but it's actually this north, this uh, bottom side here is the north magnetic pole. And the top side is the south magnetic pole. So the north side is, emana is emanating these field lines and the south side is taking them in. But we call the north and south um, just for just because of the idea of geometrical, like north and south, as opposed to magnetic north and south. And that's what allows us to say on a compass, we can just say that this side will be the north pointing side because it points north. It doesn't, it points to the south geometric pole. I'm sorry, to the south magnetic pole, but it points to the north geometric pole. And that's what we care about for navigation and stuff like that. All right, so here's how well, first, just to, before we talk about how magnetic forces work, we have to talk about cross products because that's how you find a magnetic field or a magnetic force, I should say. So basically the way cross product works is if you have two vectors, X and Y, um, something like this, I'll just draw this. And let's say, let's hold this one here. We have something like this. Then you'll see in the diagram, it'll give you something like this. And that's because the way cross product works, oh, well, I guess that's off a bit. Um, something like this. And the way cross product works is you have two vectors that are, you take the plane they're on. So in this case, the plane is this circle here. This is the plane that these two vectors are on. And then you have to consider the perpendicular to that plane. So it's a three dimensional concept and you take the vector that is perpendicular to that plane and to find the direction, what you do is if it's just uh, by convention because scientists made it up a years ago, and decided, okay, this is gonna be how we decide what direction it's gonna be. And what you do is basically, if you have a product of, let's call this vector X, let's call this vector Y. If you wanna find X cross Y, it's kind of add some uh, uh, notation because I'm using both X and this X as times, but hopefully you understand um, these are both vectors. And the way that we do this is we take our hand and we put it in the direction of x first. And then if we curl our fingers towards the direction of the next vector, which is y, then what we're doing is basically we're turning our fingers towards the screen, towards the page, whatever you want to call it. If we turn it like this, then that's what allows us, well, this orientation of hand is, allows, is what allows us to do this. If it were the opposite direction like this, then we wouldn't be able to curl our fingers that way. It has to be like this. And then in this direction, the thumb is what determines what direction the uh, the result will be. So let's call this vector z. Then the cross product is vector c, is vector z, and z is in the direction upwards because that's what direction the thumb is. So conversely, if I had something like, if y was here instead, then if y was here, then I had would have to orient my hand like this. So x would be this direction still, still to the right. And y would be kind of this out of the page direction outwards. So I point my fingers towards me and that results in my thumb facing downwards. So that means that Z vector rather than this will instead be downwards. Hopefully that makes sense. So um, here's this magnetic force formula. Basically we're using cross product here. And what we're doing is we're taking the Q, the charge, because you can probably imagine that kind of like um, electric force where it's proportional to Q or like gravity is proportional to mass. In this case, it's still proportional to Q. So Q, then times it's velocity, which is a pretty interesting idea because we haven't seen velocity really ever used in force before, but here it is. If we consider the velocity times across the magnetic field, then that's what gives us the force. So um, yeah, this is the idea of cross product. If you have a vector B like this, this direction, the vector V in this direction, then remember V cross V uh, will be 
to right, and then we curl our fingers into the screen. So that rules in thumb pointing upwards. So that means that force will be upwards. And then Q is just a scalar, basically. It doesn't do anything. It's not a vector. It's just a scalar. So that once you have this kind of product here, then you multiply it by Q, and that'll give you the force, the total force. So um, just some purpose of practice. Let's say a charge is traveling in a positive x direction. So um, here I have a coordinate axis. Let's say we have this charge here. Um, let's say it's positive. And let's say it's traveling in the positive x direction. So it's traveling in this direction. And let's say there's a magnetic field in the y direction, in the minus y direction. So that'll be this direction. And that'll be, this is V. It's the vector. This is B, B for magnetic field, kind of a weird variable notation, but you get used to it. So B for magnetic field. And what direction will the force then be? You can type in chat, have some time to think about it, figure out how to orient your hands. The classic joke among uh, high school teachers for physics is that you'll always be able to tell when people are doing the problems because they'll always be making some kind of weird hand motions in order to figure out the direction of all these different forces. Could you explain the right hand rule again? Yeah, sure. So basically, um, going back to this drawing, um, the cross product, basically right hand rule just tells us where the direction is of the resulting cross product. So um, this is X, let's call this direction Y. This is also on this plane. So this is the plane that we work with for these two vectors, X and Y. So it's gonna be this flat plane here. Um, and then when we consider the direction of X, we point our fingers in this direction and then we point, basically I'm curling my hand here, curling my hand towards Y, towards the direction into the page. This is a 3D drawing, my drawing is not the best, but basically it's into the page. So then we're curling our fingers from this direction going to the right and we're curling it into the page. And then that means that our thumb has to be oriented upwards. If my hand were oriented the other way, if I was doing this and pointing my fingers in this direction to the right, then in order to orient, or in order to curl my fingers, I would have to be curling my fingers backwards, which, which is not what I want. I want them to be, curl, to be curling forwards into the Y direction, into, into the page. So that means that it has to be facing this way. My hand has to be oriented this way. And that tells me that thumb is facing upwards. So that means that it will be in the up, upwards direction. So that's what the vector Z is. It'll be upwards. And it takes some time getting used to. It's called the right hand rule just for convention's sake. And Long time ago, people just decided, okay, we need a way to figure out what a cross product is because we've got to define this kind of stuff, especially for stuff like magnetic forces. It matters a lot whether one a force is going in one direction or the exact opposite direction. So they have to decide how we're going to determine, like how we're going to notate this stuff. And they decided that right hand rule is going to be the rule, and this is how we're going to do it. They could have easily done it the opposite way, but this is just what they chose, just for convenience sake. So. Um, after this question, we could have a charge here. It's pointing in the positive x direction and pointing in the negative y direction. So this is B and this is V. So what we're gonna do here, hopefully just help clear things up. Um, when we take when we consider a magnetic force, it's F, the F factor is gonna be equal to Q. This is a scalar, so we don't really have to worry about this for now. Let's cross it out. Uh, v cross V. And when we consider the, this cross product, what we're doing is we're considering V, this is gonna be facing towards me out of the page, my fingers, and then it's gonna be curling towards the left because that's what the direction is. And that's what the direction of V is. And then, yeah, uh, so as Anthony said, negative, that is correct. Um, we're curling our fingers towards the B direction. And that results in basically this kind of weird orientation. It may be kind of hard to see on the zoom camera, but I'm basically pointing my fingers at myself and then curling them towards the left. So then that results, my hand has to be downwards. And for the other way, if I did this, I couldn't curl my fingers towards the left. It had to be to the right. So then that means that it has to be this direction. So it has to be downwards. So you're correct in saying it has to be negative. It's gonna be in the negative z direction. This is force. And then if we want to calculate the magnitude of it, let's say this is like five meters per second. 
this is, let's say this is like also five or something. And then this is gonna be uh, Q, let's say it's like one. So an F is gonna be five or one times five times five. We're still multiplying their magnitudes together. And then that's gonna be 25 units total. And when I say um, we multiply the magnitudes, when we multiply the magnitudes together, that's a bit of a white lie. Just, just in this scenario where this is a right angle, the actual formula is a bit more complicated because uh, if we go back to this GIF here, we can see how the green arrow is varying as this red arrow rotates around the circle. That's because the angle between them actually matters quite a bit. So let's say I have this angle here, this vector here. Let's say the angle here is theta. Then the formula for this magnitude, basically, the formula for uh, the resulting uh, cross product. I'll just label this x again, I'll label this y again. So x cross y, again, pretty bad notation, but it's fine. Um, the magnitude is gonna be, we know, that, we know that direction, of course, because we can find it with the right hand rule. And the magnitude, what we're gonna use is x times y, as you'd probably expect. We also, have to figure, we also have to consider a cosine theta because the way we defined the cross product is that basically the bigger the angle between the two vectors, the greater the magnitude of the resulting product. So you can see how as these vectors are almost the same, the green arrow will basically become zero. So right here, it's zero, and then it passes through. So then, and then as it increases, as we increase the angle here, it goes back to the top and all reach reaches all the way here. The moment it is at 90 degrees. So cosine theta is what allows us to adjust for that. So then when cosine theta is cosine 90 degrees over here, it's a right angle, then that's gonna be one. So that's gonna be when it's maximized. When cosine theta or when theta is zero, cosine theta, oh, sorry, I should be using um, sine here. When theta is zero, then we're gonna be seeing that this um, whole expression is also gonna be equal to zero when they are the same. So that's the formula for fact. We don't really have to worry about that. Um, I'm able to explain some intuitive stuff, so no need to worry too much about the calculations. Just to be clear, Q is just a coefficient, right? Yeah, that's correct. Um, Q is just, let me go back to the formula. Q is just a scalar, which means it's not a vector, it's just a sum value. It's just like some, like similar to the idea of, I guess, yeah, uh, just to answer your question, it's uh, just a B cross B. And yeah, you used to relate the variables. Um, similar, uh, kind of, yeah. You might be, I think your like, question is about like, if I had a formula like uh, for force of gravity, FG is gonna be equal to negative G M M over R squared. Um, if you're asking like, is G like, kind of like this, um, kind of, it's more similar to M in this case because Basically, Q is proportional to, or force proportional to Q because that's kind of like the mass of the charge when it comes to electricity and magnetism. So Q is kind of like the M here in this scenario, just like how um, FQ or FE for force of electrostatics, um, it's, it was negative, um, what's the coefficient? There's a coefficient there, let's, let's call it C. Um, I believe it's K. Uh, negative or positive, it could be either a k q q over r squared. This is the formula for electric force and how k was a coefficient here to kind of relate the variables. And q was this kind of variable to show how powerful um, the charge was with how, how strongly attracted the charge would be attracted to the source. Basically, q is doing the same kind of thing here. And q is just here, like you said, just to be kind of a coefficient of this vector sum or this vector product in order to figure out what the direction is and everything like that, because we need a direction. It's not as simple as if we have a positive charge and a negative charge, and of course they're gonna be attracted to each other like, like so. If we have positive positive, they're going to be repelled from each other. It's like this, like this. So it's not as simple as just, they're going to be in the same line as two particles are. It's a bit more complicated. So we have to figure out this kind of equation stuff, but yeah, then Q is just there for the sake of figuring out what the actual value is, not for the sake of figuring out what the direction is.
All right. So we did that. Um, just simulation. Um, I'll paste it in chat. Yeah. Okay. So just to give you some more like intuition on how this stuff works, um, basically. I guess um, basically you can see here there's a bunch of different tabs here that we'll use later, but basically you can see how this bar magnet affects the magnetic field. I guess I could have showed this earlier, but we see here this kind of this same kind of shape that we saw before, where there is lines emanating from both these, and the magnetic field will always follow this kind of these compasses basically. All this is doing is basically showing a bunch of compasses. So if we follow the compasses, we can do something like this. This kind of shape, um, not, not very this scale, not very well drawn, but basically you can see how these kind of field lines will act if we put them near a bar magnet. And let's note how uh, we, we use uh, red for north, and we use white for south. And the same goes true for these compasses. So if you look at this one right here, the white side, the south side, is pointing towards the north side because opposites attract. And that's just how we denote field lines for magnetic fields. That's how we denote um, like magnetic sign for magnetic for, mag for magnets. And yeah, that's just how these magnets kind of work. So you can basically approximate this kind of field line. And if it's a bigger, com bigger compass, you'll see how it kind of wobbles to steady itself, but eventually it'll go back to its orientation. Uh, following just exactly where the uh, smaller compass you can see here would be. So you can drag it around, you can see how it'll do its best to kind of follow this field. And if we were instead to replace this with something like the Earth, you could think of this as the Earth here, where this is its geographic North Pole, and this is its geographic geometric South Pole. Then this would be attracted to its North Pole. So if we were standing on here on its perimeter, like if you were Kind of just pointed yourself this way and just looked at it like this from the horizontal, you would think that the earth is just normal. And you could see that this magnet basically acting like a, or the earth's inside is acting like a magnet, which allows, let's say you were a sailor and you wanted to know what north was, and you could use a compass and you could see how north follows along this direction all throughout as you move along the world. So hopefully that, um, that made sense. So yeah, I already asked this before when we're talking about Earth. So Earth's magnetic field, that's just how, it's a bit of a odd naming convention, but that is how Earth has a opposite magnetic field because even though this is the geographic North and this is the geographic South, this is actually the magnetic South and magnetic North respectively. Okay, so now we're going to talk a bit about some auroras, which are caused by magnetic fields. So you can just watch. I'll mute myself. I think I have to share sound first, actually. So let me reshare. All right, can everyone hear? If you've ever been lucky enough to see auroras, you're very lucky, and I'm very jealous because right. I never have. But I do get some joy from understanding exactly what those dazzling ripples of color are. You might have heard that they're caused by solar winds hitting our upper atmosphere, but that's one of those hand-wavy answers that doesn't actually answer anything. It's like, what's a solar wind? Why do they exist? Why does it cause crazy space colors when it hits the atmosphere? And why do they mainly happen near the poles except during some kind of major solar event? The reason we don't talk about the real answer is because it's complicated and it involves a lot of physics. Answers do that a lot around here. Before we can understand auroras, we have to understand a little bit about the Earth's magnetic field. In a lot of ways, it's just like the magnetic field you get from a typical classroom bar magnet. The lines of the magnetic field flow out the top of one pole, loop down, and flow into the other. These looping magnetic field lines create a shield around the Earth that extends into space about 64,000 kilometers. And it's shaped kind of like a donut with small holes at the top and bottom. That donut is the only thing keeping our atmosphere from getting stripped away by 28,000 degree solar plasma. And make no mistake, people say solar wind, which makes it sound all pleasant and breezy, but it's plasma. High energy, high speed, super hot particles that are byproducts of the fusion happening inside the sun. And that wind packs quite a punch. It actually distorts the shape of our magnetic donut, squashing it on the side facing the sun and blowing it out into a long tail on the other side. But although our donut bends, it does not break. So those 
those super hot, super fast particles get deflected by our magnetic field, and instead of smacking us straight in the teeth, they flow along the field lines toward the North and South Poles. And they hit our atmosphere around the holes of the donut. So wherever those holes are, that's where you see auroras, because that's where the charged particles are actually hitting the Earth. Now, from time to time, the sun breaks huge wind, if you know what I mean, releasing giant plumes of particles. The stronger the solar wind gets, the more our magnetic donut is distorted, and the bigger its holes become. During the great solar storm of 1859, for instance, the northern lights were seen as far south as Honolulu. At that point, we had more hole than donut. But that doesn't explain anything about all the pretty colors. Our atmosphere is 99% nitrogen and oxygen, and when those atoms are struck by those particles, it creates energy. That energy puts the atoms into an excited state. An atom is excited when it receives enough energy for its electrons to jump around into higher orbits around its nucleus. But while this condition is exciting, it is not stable, so the atoms in our atmosphere quickly relax back into their ground state and release the energy they absorbed from the impact in the form of photons. Those photons are little packages packets of light are the auroras that you see. Their colors vary depending on how much of what kind of gas there is in the atmosphere at a particular place and time. Oxygen atoms release photons at longer wavelengths, making green, yellow, or red light. Nitrogen atoms, meanwhile, release high-frequency blue light. The result is a breathtaking display of particle physics in action. So the question may be a quick one, but the answer isn't exactly. Thanks for asking and for watching, and thank you especially to our Subbable subscribers who All right, so hopefully that video made sense. Um, I think it's a pretty cool application of magnets. And now we will move on to electromagnetism. So this is gonna be taking the concepts we learned from magnetism and applying them. Oops, I think my stream, okay, cool. So yeah, um, this is gonna be applying the concepts we learned from electricity to what we just learned about magnetism. So recall that Electric current is just a flow of electrons. It's a flow of negative particles through a through something, through a wire, possibly. So if the wire is moved into a loop, oh, actually, if the wire is just flowing, what happens, very similar to the idea of, oops, I think my mouse froze for a second. Um, similar to this idea of how velocity and in a magnetic field will create a magnetic force. Um, Remember that force is equal to Q V cross B. So we had a particle, some particle moving in magnetic field. If we instead have that particle moving, that will actually also create a magnetic field. So if we have some kind of currents or all of the electrons here, each one, they're all moving in the same direction, let's say, and they're all creating some magnetic field. So that's a pretty interesting property. And if we bend the wire into a loop, basically we're magnifying this effect. So the more electrons moving around this loop, we're basically increasing the amount of um, magnetic field that's going into this part right here. Because the way this direction works is kind of similar to the right-hand rule. If you point your thumb into the direction of the current, so in this case, it's to left, if we point our thumb in that direction, then the curl of our fingers is going to be the direction of the magnetic field. So we'll curl our fingers, and you can see how it's, if you look head on from your thumb, you can see it's counterclockwise. So this current here, or this um, magnetic field created by the current here, will be counterclockwise as well. So it'll go uh, in this kind of circle. Um, I apologize if this is a bad question, but what is magnetic field? Well, that's a fine question. Um, I probably didn't explain too well, but yeah, I don't think I explained it much at all. But basically, you can think of it as an analog, a magnetic analog to an electric field. So uh, an electric field is what creates a force in for certain charges. So for instance, a positive charge exerts uh, an electric field emanating from itself. And remember that we had this, these properties like the denser the fields, the denser the field lines, the stronger the field. Similar to idea, um, we have also magnetic field lines. This is a bar magnet. So similar to idea we had about electric field lines, this is a magnetic field line. So, uh, so some similarities here, they're both caused by kind of these positive and negative 
I don't, I don't want to say charges because that's not the case. It's not what we call magnets, but these positive and negative pieces and north side results in emanation from it. South side absorbs it, positive side uh, releases these uh, field lines and the south side will absorb them in. And that's just how the direction works. And they will result in a force. So if you place some kind of test charge here like this, then this charge would result and this, this uh, field will result in a force like so, whereas a field uh, is created and causes a magnetic force uh, due to this field. So basically a field resulting from forces by a magnet. Um, I wouldn't say a field resulting from forces, I would say a force resulting from fields, but you can think of it like that, where basically um, for fields and forces are very closely intertwined. And wherever you have a field, you can see a force if you just put a charge in it. But in the case of a magnetic field, the charge has to be moving. So um, very unique. If you consider the, like, two other forces we've learned about so far, like gravity and electric forces, both cases is just you put something in a field and it'll start having a force exerted on it. But it's not the case with a magnetic field. In a magnetic field, you need the particle to not only be there with a the charge, you also need it to be moving along so that um, there'll be some force exerted on it by this magnetic field. So hopefully that uh, answers your question. All right, so um, yeah, this kind of loop here is basically all we're doing is we're just bending it into a loop. And that way, if you have this kind of arc here, then you can loop all the way around and they'll all arc inwards so that this spot right here will have a much greater magnetic field than you would if you just considered a spot like here or a spot like here. And that's, um, this is also, if you go back to the simulation we opened up before, just to put the link in chat, I'll just paste it again. Um, yeah, this link here, we can send go to a pickup coil. And this is a second tab here. And you can see how, if I move this magnet, you can kind of see, actually, um, not this one. We can talk about, um, Actually, we haven't gotten to it yet, but I guess this kind of works. So I haven't talked too much about this, but basically a changing magnetic field will result in a current. So very similar to the idea of how a, a current results in magnetic, magnetic field, a changing magnetic field will result in current, but we'll get to that later. Basically, all I'm saying is that if we move this magnet around, that'll cause a current through this loop and it'll cause a light bulb to flash onwards. And this is a basically a battery with current here, of course. And you can see how this is forming its own magnetic field. So I'm gonna borrow a magnet, <clears throat> excuse me. From the, bar, from the bar magnet, you can see how we're forming this magnetic field from all the compasses around it. You can see how there's this field here that's created similar to the shape that we saw before, of it's like this kind of spiral here not spiral, this kind of loop. And just like that, we have an electromagnet. So we have current flowing through here. This is what we call a solenoid. And the solenoid becomes this basically mag this magnet. And we call that an electromagnet. So what that does is it's very similar to this bar magnet where the, all the all these fields or all these compasses point this direction, this kind of circular arc direction so that we can see how they loop. Very similar, it's an electromagnet will also do that. And it'll, you can see how the magnets or the compasses will point themselves to orient its path because it's just like a magnet itself. <clears throat> and I'll get to this stuff about the pickup coil and transformer later. So um, if we have a fun visit with a good friend in Bill Nye, um, sound sharing so should still be on, so. And a steel nail. Now, steel is mostly iron. I'm going to put the nail in the coil and attach it to this battery. When I do, the nail will pick up these steel pins. That's because when the electricity flows, it's forming a magnetic field. When I let go, the 
field lets go, although the nail holds on a little bit. When electricity is flowing through a wire, it creates a magnetic field around the wire. When we wrap the wire in a coil, the magnetic field is concentrated. When it flows through a piece of magnetic material like steel, it gets concentrated even more. And so we can use electromagnets to move things around and operate mechanisms. It's what Michael Faraday called electromagnetism. So yeah, this concept of electromagnetism is what allows Bill and I here to pick up those uh, small nails with that, or those small metal pieces <clears throat> with that bigger nail wrapped with a wire wrapped around. Because as we saw here, um, this loop creates a con uh, condensation basically of this current carrying wire, which condenses its uh, magnetic field. And when we wrap that multiple wires around in the loop, that condenses it even more. And as Bill and I said, if we put a iron core through that, I didn't mention this, but that will condense the effect even more, and it'll create a stronger magnetic field. And the way that works is basically, if you have an iron core, if you consider a piece of iron, it'll have a lot of different atoms in it. And each of these atoms are not going to be uh, uniform. They're going to have some kind of orientation, like if I draw like this, uh, for instance, you can think of it as tiny little compasses inside of them. So let's just say it's so north side and white will be south side, but it's north. You can think of it kind of as there's all these different um, things in here and they all different orientations. It's like so, um, not a great diagram, but it'll do, I guess. And if you have it like this, it won't be, it won't be creating any kind of magnetic field. However, if it's a material like iron, then it'll react to some kind of other magnetic field. So if I put a magnetic field that's pointing in this direction, like here, if for some, for instance, I had a wire wrapped around like this, a solenoid that had a current running through it. It's a very bad diagram, but uh, bear with me. Um, something like this. Then if the current was running through it, then it would create a magnetic field inside of it, which would look something like this arrow here. So if that is created, then what will happen is that all of these um, different compasses, I guess, inside of this magnet will orient themselves in order to match it as well, because that's, that's how iron works. So that results in all of them pointing in this direction. And when we have all these tiny compasses pointing in this direction, then what that creates is its own magnetic field because iron is magnetic. And therefore, if you have all these compasses pointing in the same direction, then that'll create, that'll create its own magnetic field. Each of them is very, very small, but if you unite them all together, then using this magnetic field and putting an iron core inside of it, then what you're, what you're doing is you're creating a second additional magnetic field due to this iron piece. And that will let you create an even bigger magnetic field than you had initially. So that's what Bill and I is saying when he says that we can magnify the magnetic field even more. Hopefully that makes sense. All right, so here's a video about motors. And this is a great application of um, electric fields and just magnets in general. And it's a good review, review video for everything we've talked about so far. So I'll play it. If you look around your house, you will see many devices that have electric motors, such as kids' toys, table fans, toothbrushes, hair dryers, and this electric cutting knife. But how does the electric motor work? You turn it on and somehow it starts rotating. Why is that? In this video, we'll cover the basics of electricity and magnets, and then put it all together to understand how the motor works. This video is sponsored by Brilliant. Let's start with something called a circuit. You have a battery, some wires, and a device that uses electricity such as a light bulb. Electricity flows through the circuit, but as soon as there is a break in the wire, the electricity stops flowing and the light bulb goes off. The path must be complete for the circuit to work. This is best done through the use of a switch. Electricity is flowing down the wire. This is called conventional flow. If we take the battery out and flip it, then the current will flow the other way. 
The light bulb will still work in either case, but there are some devices that will work differently depending on which way the current flows. Okay, so that's the basics of a circuit. Now let's come over here. This is a magnet. It has a north pole and a south pole, and it likes to attract other metal objects like these paper clips. If you bring another magnet towards it, opposite poles attract, and the same poles repel. The magnets don't have to be in this shape. For example, some magnets might be more flat like this. You can think of this magnet as always on, it's always working, you can't really turn it off. That's why it's sometimes called a permanent magnet. It's made up of many smaller magnetic domains that are lined up in the same direction. But later, I'll show you a type of magnet where this is not always the case. Let's take one of our permanent magnets and drill a hole in the center and put it on something that will allow it to spin. Now bring another magnet towards it. Our spinning magnet will immediately line up until opposite poles are right next to each other. Now switch out the side magnet. The same poles repel and opposite poles attract. If we keep switching out these side magnets, then our spinning magnet will just keep spinning. This concept of the spinning magnet is really important. We'll come back to it in a moment. Here's a metal bolt which is not a magnet. It's made up of magnetic domains, but they are pointing in random directions. Now let's take a wire, wrap it around several times, and then create a circuit. The current through the wires forces the magnetic domains to line up. That means we've just made a magnet, or more specifically, an electromagnet. It can do the same things that a permanent magnet can. It can pick up pieces of metal, and it has a north and a south pole which will attract or repel other magnets. But the electromagnet is special, in the sense that it can be turned on or off, just like the light bulb. You can't do that with a permanent magnet. Now watch what happens when we flip the battery. The electric current was flowing this way, but now it flows the other way. This will cause the poles on our magnet to switch places. North will become south, and south will become north. This is called reversing the polarity of an electromagnet. Instead of flipping the battery, an easier way to do this is to just switch the wires. You should be aware that the electromagnet will get very hot if it's on for a while. Just a caution in case this video inspires any science projects. Let's come back to our spinning magnet. This time we'll replace the spinning magnet with our electromagnet. As soon as we connect the wires, the magnet turns on and it lines up with the side magnet. Now, in reality, connecting these wires would prevent the bolt from spinning freely. But what's important here is the concept of the spinning electromagnet. Now let's switch the wires to reverse the poles on the electromagnet. The same poles repel and opposite poles attract. Now reverse the polarity again. Same poles repel and opposite poles attract. If we keep switching the polarity, our electromagnet will just keep spinning. To make this stronger, let's bring in another permanent magnet on the side. Notice how this side has the south pole towards the center, and this side has the north pole towards the center. The side magnets work together to spin the one in the middle. This right here shows the very basics of an electric motor, but we need to make a few improvements. The two side magnets can be replaced with stronger curved magnets. And instead of a bolt with wires, we're going to use a metal loop. This is called the armature. Connect our wires and we have a circuit again. This time, you can think of the electromagnet as flat like this with the south pole pointing up. Now the armature will spin until opposite poles are lined up. We can keep it spinning by switching the wires just like we did before. But this is a lot of work to sit here and manually switch these wires. We need to add something to the armature called a commutator. It's a ring with gaps on the opposite sides. The commutator will spin along with the armature. Now we connect the circuit with two brushes on the side. These brushes will slide along as the commutator spins, and they are spring-loaded so that they always maintain contact. The current flows from the wire, through the brush, the commutator ring, the armature loop, and back through the other side. Now we have our electromagnet and the armature spins. As we come around this time, the brushes will switch contact to the other side of the commutator ring. Remember, there's two brushes, so this is happening on both sides. Before the switch, the current in the armature is flowing this way. After the brushes switch sides, the current will flow the other way. This means the electromagnet switches polarity, which will cause the armature to keep spinning. This commutator ring does the same thing as switching the wires like we were doing before, but this time it does it all on its own. It will continue to spin as long as we're connected to a battery. Disconnect the battery, no more electromagnet, and the spinning stops. 
Now, so far, we've only used one loop on the armature. This will cause our motor to have an irregular speed, and in fact, we could get stuck in this position, with the brushes halfway between commutator segments. What we can do is split the commutator ring and then add another loop. So first, the brushes are in contact with these two commutator segments, which turns on this electromagnet, which causes it to start spinning. Once we get to here, the brushes switch contact to the next pair of commutator segments, which means this loop turns off and the next loop turns on. Now this electromagnet wants to spin. The brushes switch contact and the next loop turns on. This keeps happening as our motor spins. It's almost like the loops will take turns being an electromagnet. Some electric motors will add many loops to the armature. This ensures that there will be a continuous spinning motion on the motor. This spinning force on the armature is called a torque. Stronger torque means a faster spin. There are some things we can do to improve the torque of the motor. Electromagnets are stronger when there are more wires. This is true when we wrap more wires around the metal bolt, and it's also true when each of our armature loops are made of many wires. The motor will have stronger electromagnets, which means it will spin faster. If you look at some pictures of real electric motors, you can see lots of wires wrapped around. And yes, this is the same reason. More wires wrapped around means stronger electromagnets. Another way to make this stronger is to use more electricity. Let's learn a few more terms here. The part that doesn't move is called the stator. In this case, it's the two permanent magnets on the side. These fit inside the edges of the motor case. The armature in the middle is also called a rotor. Remember, this is the part that spins. The axle goes through the middle here and then sticks out the back of the motor. What I've shown you in this video is called a DC motor. If you have a device that moves and is powered by a battery, there's a good chance there's a DC motor in it. Other types of electric motors will work a little differently than what I've shown here. No matter the type of motor, most of them will produce some type of spinning motion. Once it's spinning, we can use this to make different devices move. In this case, a kid's toy. Or even a fan that cools your room. The spinning of the motor can be converted to other types of movement, such as the side-to-side -side motion that we see in this fan. Or how about this electric cutting knife? Each blade is going back and forth. It all starts with the spinning of the motor to turn a gear, which then pushes these two pieces back and forth. So hopefully this video has made a few light bulbs go off in your brain. If you like learning new things, head on over to Brilliant. This is a problem solving website and app that focuses specifically on math and science. The idea here is that you learn by doing. Pick a top. All right, hopefully that video made a lot of sense and I hope that was a great review. I think it was, uh, it really shows the power of why we want to do this in the first place because it can help power a lot of different things and it's a great review. So um, this is mentioned electromagnetic induction. So basically it's very similar to the idea of creating current in a magnetic field or a current creating a magnetic field. Method is basically the opposite. So instead of a magnetic field that's resulting from a current. So we have a current here from this wire. That will create, <clears throat> that'll create a magnetic field using right-hand rule. We can figure out that it's gonna be in this direction. Um, instead of this idea, instead of current creating a magnetic field, we can think of a magnetic field creating current. So uh, if we had a loop, if we have a coil like this, then let's say we have a magnetic field going through the coil like this, this is going to be B. If instead suddenly we change B to the opposite direction, then something like this, something like that, then all of a sudden we would have a induced current. So it would create a current in some direction. I'm not going to go into how you would find the magnitude of this because it's a bit complicated and I don't really want to get bogged down in the details of this kind of idea. But basically, when you all of a sudden change the current or change the magnetic field with it through a loop, then the current is created in that loop. So we're gonna have a current, I guess, or suddenly it's a flow of current. So um, you might be asking, like, hey, why do you want why do you want to do this? This is the opposite of what we're trying to do. 
less idea of generators. So motors take electricity and they convert them into mechanical power. Generators are the opposite. They take mechanical power and turn them into electricity. And how will we get the mechanical power to do this? Um, often, very often, it's the form of stuff like water. So this comes down to basically how basically all generators work. Basically, all of them just basically use heat or some kind of motion in order to turn water into steam. And then that steam turns a turbine, a turbine, and that will turbine will go into, it'll feed into an electric generator uh, right here. This is all a big process just to take something and turn water into steam. That way we can turn steam using, using a turbine. We can use that turbine to power a generator and that will give us the ability to uh, create power. There's some other stuff here that's not too important to this discussion, but basically take this part, replace it with a fossil fuel plant and some coal, uh, oil, whatever. All you're doing is you're using that power source, you're burning it, you're taking that, you're using it to heat water, you're using it to create steam, using the steam to turn a turbine, and that's what creates electricity. You turn the turbine to, to make the mechanical power go to electricity. And then that electricity will go from transmission line to your house to do mechanical power in the form of a motor. So that's this big idea. And uh, this, this might not be super obvious why you use electricity. Well, um, you probably think just think of the power lines. Power lines are pretty convenient. They're very useful. They can give your house power. If you want to trans, if you want to transfer electricity, if you want to transmit energy um, with mechanical stuff, that would be using gears. And if you just look at the trans transmission into your car, this is just a car, so a very small size compared to something like a highway or a power line, a whole power grid. Um, this is already pr pretty complicated. I'm, can, I cannot tell you at all how this could possibly work, but that's already pretty complicated. And if you want to transmit it a very long distance, well, that would be basically impossible. So that's why we use electricity because it can be transferred long distances as well as turned into whatever kind of need we have. So um, last simulation to talk about, um, if we talk about this pickup coil, I mentioned this a little bit before, but basically if we choose where we want to take the magnetic field, you can see if I move it here, it's changing the magnetic field inside here. If you look at this, pay attention to the compass as I do this, these compasses inside will change directions. And if you do that fast enough, you can see how there's a little bit of flashing. That's not a lot. If we want more, what I could do, I could push it through. And that will create a much bigger change. If I want even more, I can do it much more fast, much more, much more quickly. And that creates a much bigger change in um, magnetic field per unit time, because as long as it keeps changing, then we'll see a current. If I leave it at rest here and move it in and just leave it there, then all we'll see is nothing. We won't see any current at all. So the main point here is that it's a change in magnetic field that drives a current, just like how a current is what drives a magnetic field. So yeah, I can also move the, uh, this current here or this loop here, and it's all relative. So moving this uh, loop here is the same thing as moving this magnet, magnet when it comes to the perspective of this um, light bulb here, let's say, or let's say of the wire. As long as I'm moving this around, it doesn't really matter whether I'm moving this loop around or I'm moving this magnet around, it's all the same when you talk about perspective. So of course it's different to us, but if you just look at the reference frame through those objects, through the magnet, the, the bar magnet, through the um, through the coil, then all we're doing here is we're changing the relative position of this magnetic field, and that'll result in this current being formed. And if you think about, if we wanted to split an electromagnetic instead, we could of course do the same. So I can do this, and you can see how this would change as well. So this basically a substitute for a bar magnet, but also works with electricity. And as we saw with the motor, um, this can be turned off and on, which makes it much more powerful than your standard magnet having an electromagnet. So that's what we would use a motor for. The generator, um, this is kind of a similar idea to this transformer here. Basically we're, or I guess more similar to this pickup coil, basically changing the magnetic field here. But instead of changing the position where the magnetic field is coming from, instead we'll be changing the angle. So here, I'll just show you the field, just like this. 
But if I turn on this water here, this is kind of how a generator would work for a water generator. And if I start pumping this, you can see how the wheel is turning. The compass is turning at 44 RPM right now, and it all results in a much in a very quickly changing field. And you can see if you observe here in this space right here between the loops, inside the loop, the magnetic field is indeed changing. And that's what allows this current to be flowing, which allows this light bulb to be lighting up. And if I were to decrease the speed at which this is turning, it would, of course, decrease the rate of change of the magnetic field. And that would, in turn, decrease the amount of current going through the wire. So that would decrease the amount of brightness that the light bulb gives off. And similarly, if I were to increase it, then it would start going much faster. I can pump out all the max, all the way to the maximum, and you can see how now the light bulb is basically going crazy because of how quickly the magnetic field is changing. And you can kind of see an interesting pattern here where it, if I slow it down a bit, you can see how it expands once, uh, shrinks a little bit, expands, then shrinks all the way, and when it's a repeat. And you can see a bit more clearly if I use this voltmeter, you can see how it varies. It shakes a bit. It goes from one side, then comes in again, then it goes back to the extreme and goes to the other side, rinse and repeat. And that has something just to do with how this uh, compass is, uh, this magnetic field is turning because when you're turning it right here, I'll start it right there. If it's like this, then it's all, these are all straight. And then if I turn it here, um, like this, this is another place where it's changing the most. So you can kind of figure out, kind of observe how as the magnetic magnet is turning, you can see how it would affect the voltage change or the um, current change. And that's what's happening with this changing voltage. So hopefully that all made sense. I kind of went pretty quickly through that. Um, I think this, these are just some interesting topics to talk about, E and M. Not really something you have to, talk, you have to learn for competition physics and FU.MA, stuff like that. That won't cover anything from E and M. That'll be all mechanics. If you're planning on taking FU.MA, that's the physics competition. Um, I think this is just a pretty interesting topic to learn. Um, hopefully you all enjoyed it. Um, any questions? Um, if not, that'll be all for today. So uh, thank you for listening. Um, see you guys.